A friend of mine, retired Pastor Rod Ellertson, uh, served for many years at Highland Lutheran Church, which, in, which is in the center Washington, just a little bit north of Vancouver, Washington, where I was serving at the time. And Rod enjoyed telling the story about when he was six years old and in Sunday school one Sunday morning, they studied the story of Genesis chapter two, where God creates the first human, the first earth creature, Adam, which is the word Adam means earth creature. And what caught Rod's attention was that God first uh, scooped together some earth, some mud, and formed the, the body of a, of, a, of a person. But then God leaned down and breathed life into Adam and Adam became alive. And six-year-old Rod said to himself, hmm, I think I'll try that. So he went out in back of the house. He lived on, he grew up on a farm and there was a creek uh, flowing through the, the farmland just in back of his house. He went out to the creek and he, he, he scooped a bunch of mud together from the creek banks and he fashioned a nice human person that was kind of laying on his back on the ground with his hands folded across his chest. And Rod said that he took uh, particular care to fashion a head on the person eyes, ears, mouth, and also a nose that stuck out from the face. And then he took a little twig and kind of poked in little nostrils in the nose of the man. But then a real uh, critical moment of decision came for Rod because he realized that if he was gonna breathe life into this creature that he had made, if he was really gonna breathe life, that he'd have to lean down and put his mouth over the, the nose and the mouth of his earth creature, and he was gonna get a a mouthful of mud if he did that. Now, uh, uh, creek bank mud where the cows have come to drink is not a real pretty scene. And so Rod just sat there for the longest time looking at his little formed uh, person and wanting to somehow breathe life in him but knowing that he was gonna get a mouthful of mud. And finally he realized he couldn't do it so he waved goodbye to his little person and went back home for the day. In our gospel lesson for this morning, Jesus also wants to breathe life into the disciples. Not because they are mud creatures, but they are, they are paralyzed. They're only, they're only half alive. And what had happened to them is that they had uh, shut themselves up in fear in this house. They were half alive from the fear. And with good reason, just two days previously, they had seen Jesus uh, crucified on a cross and put to death and buried in a tomb. And for them, the, 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 that power of death, that power of the authorities that they were sure were gonna come and get them and arrest them and put them to death as well, that just made them afraid enough that they just, they just walled themselves up in that own little room. The strange thing about this story, as you know, is that all of this happened on the evening of the first Easter, so Jesus had already risen from the dead. And in fact, some of the disciples had seen the risen Christ. Mary Magdalene had, the disciples from Emmaus had. They, they, in their heads, in their heads, they knew that Jesus was risen from the dead. But that good news hadn't got to their hearts yet or to their experience because they still felt like the, the powers of death were so strong. The powers that were out to get them were so strong that that's what ruled the day. And so they were half dead, half alive, walled up in their own little house. The question, the question that this, this puts to us here on this Sunday after Easter, the question it puts to us is, um, in what ways do we get walled up in a half alive state? Uh, what are the things that trap us? What are the things that cut us off so we are only half alive? Or to put it another way is, where in our lives do we need Jesus to come to breathe life into us? For over a year now, we, a lot of us, have been uh, locked up in our own houses for good reason. We were taking appropriate precautions around the COVID-19. Uh, some of us were able to uh, stay at home and do our work from home. Others of you had to be out there in the world. You were medical workers, you were first responders. So it's, it was different for different people. But I think for a, for a full year, for a full year, we have sort of had uh, ingrained in us the notion that you gotta be wary around other people. Uh, you gotta be careful about who you touch and who's breathing near you. 
And so we've had sort of this experience of being, of being locked up in our own private space. Fortunately now with vaccines, that's beginning to be alleviated for many of us. Uh, still important to take due precautions, but that's changing. But for a year, we've had the experience of being kind of closed off from each other, at least emotionally, if not physically. And that happens in other ways in our lives too, that we get, we get closed off from each other, that we, we, we lock ourselves away from each other. So for example, when there's a conflict in the family, that can happen easily, a conflict between siblings, a conflict between parents and children. And if you can't work it through, it's often the case that people uh, withdraw from each other. They close themselves off emotionally or just maybe physically, they separate, they don't even talk to each other. There's different ways in which we get locked in our rooms of, of fear of judgment, that can happen sometimes. We can sometimes do that to ourselves if, we are, uh, if we're carrying some shame about something, if our life didn't turn out the way we wanted it to, or if uh, as, we go old, as we grow older, we feel like we just aren't the person we used to be. We can get locked up by our own self-judgment and our own shame. And it's at that time that we feel, we discover like the disciples, we are half alive in a locked room someplace. That can happen to us, not just uh, personally, but it can happen to us collectively as well. In our society, in our society, we tend to divide ourselves up and, and lock ourselves away from each other. And so in a society where there's more consciousness about the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, there's some real, there's some real economic splits among us. There's some real splits between young and old. Right now, we're particularly conscious of the the ways in which we are racially divided about our judgments, the judgments we make towards ourselves and towards one another based on the color of our skin really divides us. It locks us up into rooms away from each other. Right now, the, the trial of Derek Chauvin is going on, the officer who murdered George Floyd. And we, if we watch the news, we, are, we see once again the unspeakably horrible scene of Derek Chauvin kneeling on George Floyd's neck for, for eight and a half minutes, long past the point when other people, even the other officers are saying, he's, he's dead, he's dead. And it's a, it's a sign of what we struggle with in terms of the division between races and our, and our judgments towards people of other colors. If something like that, if, if something like that would happen to one of us who are from a white family, if, uh, if someone would kneel on the, the neck of one of our white relatives, first of all, we would be shocked. We would say, this just simply can't happen. But secondly, we would be totally outraged that such a thing would take place. And yet it's a realization that in our country and in the world itself, uh, so many judgments are made and, and advantages are given or not given to people based on the color of their skin. And so as we sit here today, as we Lutherans who are part of a worshiping congregation, I doubt that hardly any of us uh, belong to the Proud Boys. I doubt that uh, hardly any of us wake up in the morning with, uh, with conscious thoughts that we want to go out and mistreat, that we want to go out and be mean or violent to a person of another, of another race. We don't, we don't think that way. That's not how we are consciously. But over the last 18 months, we've been, become more aware but of how just how things operate, just how society is regulated, that people are treated according to the color of their skin. And so we see the, the number of, of, of black people that have been killed around the United States in very unfair ways. We've seen the six Asian women murdered in Atlanta. Uh, just a week ago, a, an elderly Korean woman was beat up here in Tacoma simply because she was Korean, because she was Asian. And so we grieve how the fact that this racism takes place. And once again, it's not necessarily a, a conscious decision on our parts, but it happens when there's racism at work, when someone goes out to buy a house and a family who's white gets far different treatment than a family of color, or you go to rent a house and who does the landlord rent to, or uh, when, is, when you apply for a job. I'm talking about this because it's a vivid example of how we, in our fears, in our judgments towards others, we divide ourselves up into groups and we lock ourselves away from each other. But in the process, we all become paralyzed in our fears. In the process, we all become just half alive instead of fully alive. And so that's why Jesus 
comes to us who are locked in these places of conflict or of poor health or whatever it is. Jesus comes to us to breathe on us. The great scene in the gospel lesson where Jesus says to the disciples, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus, uh, like God making Adam come alive at the beginning of time, Jesus wants a new beginning for the disciples. So he breathes into him his own Holy Spirit. He breathes into them peace, shalom. Shalom is not just a, a wonderful word. Shalom is God's power to heal, to put back together what's been broken into pieces. Shalom is that that brings communities together. So Jesus comes to the disciples. And when Jesus breathes in that spirit, the disciples are empowered to leave that room and to go out into the world and to bring that spirit to others. And so today, Jesus comes to breathe upon us, to breathe upon us, to fill us with that healing spirit. So not only our own brokenness is healed, not only our own half-aliveness is brought to full life, but so that we can go out in the world and we can bring that spirit of grace and power and peace and justice to the people around us. A long time ago when uh, they constructed the church calendar, so the calendar of Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, and Easter, and so forth, when they constructed the church calendar, they gave 50 days for the season of Easter. There's one Easter day, but there are 50 days in the season of Easter. And I think they gave us 50 days because we need time to let this sink in. We need time to let the Spirit of God move from just our head to our hearts. The disciples needed time, uh, even after Jesus had been raised from the dead. And we need time. We need time for the Spirit to come into all those places in our lives, in our families, in our communities, where we are split, where we are locked, where we are broken apart. We need time. And so this is the time to receive that. Today is the day to again receive the very Spirit of Christ. For Jesus comes to you today. Jesus comes to you and says, receive my spirit, receive my peace. Let this heal you, let this bring you fully alive, and then go, go into the world to bring this spirit to others. May God bless you. May God bless you as you are made alive by Christ. May God bless you as you take that life into the world. In Jesus' name, amen.